I am not a designer. Um, I'm actually a, a chemist. I'm trained as a chemical engineer. Uh, but I happen to work in a department that is half scientists and half designers. So we call it a schizophrenic department, you know, <laughs> different brains. But it has been an incredible experience for me. I'm coming from Cornell University, a small town of Ithaca, New York. Um, <clears throat> and, and I'm going to talk about uh, can nanotechnology be fashionable? These are projects in which my students have used some of the chemistry that we have developed in the lab to develop concepts and prototypes. So a little bit different than, than we saw before because we like to work from the bottom up. We want to work from a molecule, each one molecule at a time. So um, we are very happy. We're going to build a new campus. I saw that everybody was showing a video, but we don't. we're going to build a new campus in New York, the Cornell Tech. It will be focused on the interface between science, design, and economics. And we will have these three different uh, thrusts connective media, healthier life, and built environment. And so next time, in five years, you will go through Roosevelt Island. That will be our new campus. So I, I work with a, a different material that I can guarantee you that 100% of the people here are wearing a piece of cotton. Uh, and we have been doing that for thousands of years. Uh, and you may wonder why we still keep using the same molecule for thousands and thousands of years. And cotton is one of the most fascinating and misunderstood materials. It's an actual engineer material. So if I want to recall my talk, give a new name, I will say it. I, I want to redefine the concept of cotton as a fiber. I want to make cotton, force cotton to do what cotton normally doesn't do. So I'm going to give you a couple examples. So the first example um, has to be with this, the motivation of why do I work in nanoscience and textiles? And it sounds like an oxymoron, but if you look at the... Every 50 years since the 1800s, we have a revolution based on technology. And it happens that that revolution makes a lot of money. People that invest at the beginning of the revolution makes an incredible amount of, of wealth. So the first one that benefited from knowledge and translated that into money was the textile industry. Was able to take all the developments of the steam engines and transfer that into mass production and make tons of money. Then came the railroads that transformed the transportation. Uh, then automobiles, computers, and we hope that this is the next revolution will be nanotech. So we focus on mer merging two revolutions that are 200 years apart. But one of the things that textiles can do is to manufacture. Yeah, We can manufacture things in large amounts with gr great reproducibility, as the previous speaker mentioned. And in the nanoscale world, my world, we can control materials at very scale, one atom at a time. So how we got the inspiration, this is uh, the cartoon of my heroes, my superheroes. Uh, she'll say the founding fathers and, and mothers, because there's the Wonder Woman also in the middle. But if you think this, this actually, I took this picture from a cartoon book in 1942. This is 1942, this is 1937. In 1937, there was not a material called Lycra or spandex. But you have Flash, yeah? Flash has materials attached to the, to the skin. And then you have Batman and the Wonder Woman with materials that can stop bullets, that can stop fire. And that technology did not exist in 1937. Now, in the 2013, we have those materials. We have those fibers. We have developed chemistry to make these materials. But the important thing is if you can dream it in the 1930s, you can actually make it happen. So what we dream now, imagine what we dream now, the cycles will make them possible in less than 80 years. So that that's was my inspiration. Um, actually, Superman looks a little chubby in this one, but uh, <laughs> it's also a different concept. So the first one is we, can, we place nanoparticles, these particles in the order of 10 to 20 nanometers, and we can place them very close to each other, so close that and they don't agglomerate. So the space between particles is so small that we can control the interaction between light and matter. We control the wavelength of light. So we control the color that you can produce. You can make colors uh, by changing the particle size or by changing the space between particles. And one of my students, a uh, uh, fashion designer, Olivia, she made these two dresses in which all the colors are produced with um, nanoparticles. So you have in top uh, materials, we don't have it all. 
This is materials made with silver nanoparticles, gold nanoparticles, and the color is made by the interaction of the particles and the spacing between particles. So you can move the particles apart, you can create a different color, or you can change the diameter of the particle, and then you can make a different color. And no pigments, no dyes. And that interaction of particles at such level is, is, is incredible because you can pretty much manipulate any interaction of a matter with light. Um, but the thing that I really wanted to do is was to actually, even though they were so close, I wanted to transfer one electron from one particle to the next. And I was not able to do so without agglomerating the particles. So one of the solutions that we found was to actually put catalyst on the surface of the particles and do a chemical reaction between one particle and the other and create a bridge with a po conductive polymer in such a way that we have a conductive link that allows an electron to go from one side to the other. Um, that was, allow us to do things like this. So if you look at this circuit, this, is, this, this conductive thread is actually cotton. So it feels like cotton, it drapes like cotton, because it's 99.9999% cotton. There is only five nanometers of uh, a layer between particles and polymers. So one of my students actually wanted to use this in a dress. She uh, put solar cells on her dress and at the same wanted to charge the iPhone. That was about a few years ago. Uh, and then at the same time, she was sewing the, the dress. Uh, she was connecting the circuitry with the same device. Uh, that was uh, Abby Liebman. You can see them here. But so that was conductive electricity is something very fun. Yeah, you can do conductive electricity, there's conductive yarns. But we wanted to do something a little bit smarter. What can we do with these materials that um, can make them a little bit more functional? So we decided to do something a little bit crazy was to make transistors. Transistors made of cotton. So these transistors, uh, how many electrical engineers here? You are an electrical engineer. Okay, perfect. <laughs> okay, so we have three components, a drain, a gate, and a, a source. And all of them were made of cotton, and we made two transistors. One is an electrochemical transistor, and the other one was a fuel effect transistor. And it, all of them are made from cotton, and, uh, and we got very beautiful responses on, on the transistor side. And so all the information that I'm showing here is public, so you can get the papers and get that information. And I got inspired by this device here. Uh, anybody has, knows what this is? A kipu, yeah. So I, I'm originally from Colombia, and I went to a, a trip in Peru, and this is an instrument, that, a calculator, used by the Incas to communicate numbers and operations. So instead of using uh, a written language, they did not have a written uh, code, they use these knots and different fibers. So I want to make the same. I want to make a calculator, a, a little microprocessor made of, from cotton. So instead of adding electronics to the material, we're going to make the material actually be the electronics. Uh, so if you can imagine how many junctions you have in your shirt, you can create a significant amount of computer power in your, in your devices. Um, the next experiment was uh, my student, Jennifer King. She's now working for Adidas. We work with these beautiful molecules on the left side. I oh, have the same problem. Uh, the left side, these molecules are metal organic frameworks. We can control the spacing between, between the, the molecules so we can capture gases in a very specific manner. Uh, my student used to run, and she found that when she ran in cities with traffic, the, the smell from the car exhaust got into your hair or your clothes. So she wanted to capture those gases. So we designed these molecules to capture those gases in a very specific manner, controlling the spacing and the linkers between the, the metal groups. So the, the yellow circle that you see that is the size of the molecule of gas. And then we developed chemistry to make cotton be able to grow this molecule from a cotton base. And she made a mask and the little cape. Um, and these molecules can capture any particular gas will, will capture smells, for example, the places that smell pretty, pretty bad. Oh, a lot of military applications also for uh, chemical and biological warfare gases. Most of my work is funded by the, by the military. Um, the last example I want to show you before I get caught um, is uh, at the same time that we can capture molecules, we can also capture and release. And I have a student coming from the Gambia uh, in Africa, and uh, that's right here. Uh, Matilda, 
And she was very concerned about malaria. Malaria is a, is a, is a killer, it's the, high, the highest killer in, in the world. A lot of people die from malaria, but uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a problem that we still have in 2013, and there is no <coughs> final solution. So what we did with that, until that was to create a molecule that will be able to trap the insecticides. And then these insecticides will be released in a controlled manner. And we did that by controlling the linkers between the metals so we can expand and contract as a function of temperature. So we can release the insecticide when, at the time that was more needed, when the mosquito is, is more active. So to do that, she actually made a cape. Uh, here is the cape. So the molecules are actually in the cape, in the blue cape, and that was a concept for a mosquito bed net uh, prototype that we did. So with that, I want to finish. I guess uh, I'm over time now. No? OK. OK. So um, basically what we do is we want to, uh, um, we are chemists, we are material scientists. We like to create materials that perform a function instead of adding the, the function to the material. We want the material to be the function. And we want to redefine what cotton is. See, if a molecule has been for thousands of years, it must be a reason. Think yourself, why do you wear cotton? Yeah? So imagine all the things that you can make with cotton, make color, uh, you can capture gases, you can kill bacteria. So you don't have to, you may have to wear only one piece of clothing all your life. I, I hate washing, so that's one of the, my main motivations. <laughs> so if I have, for example, this blue, sweater, and it happens that there is a Cornell game, uh, then I can move the nanoparticles on my sweater and it becomes red. Then I can go and cheer for Cornell. But suppose that Cornell lost and I switch to pink or uh, to orange and say, go Princeton, yeah? Um, <laughs> things like that uh, are possible now at a nanoscale level, controlling molecules at a single atom at a time. Uh, again, I am not a designer. I have um, no training in design. But I have wonderful students from Cornell that work in design, and I'm just a chemist. So we, this has been an incredible experience for me over the, over the last six years, working on this interaction between the way designers think and scientists think. So I think I'm done. So with that, I want to say thank you very much. And all the information is on the website, and uh, all the papers on these developments are also available. Thank you.